Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to John chapter 4, which was read for us earlier. John chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, it's there printed in your worship guide a couple pages back. And as you do that, let me pray for us. God in heaven, we are coming to what is a familiar text to many of us. But I pray that you would break through in surprising ways like you did that day for that woman by that well. That we might encounter you by your spirit this morning. That you might be glorified as we behold Jesus Christ. And that we would be changed if she was. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. Well, last week we looked at John 3 and the story of Nicodemus. He was up and in. But she's down and out. He was educated in the best schools. The teacher of Israel. She has no education. He was a Pharisee respected amongst the populace. She has no esteem. He was privy to erudite theological debates, even vague allusions to the Old Testament. She knows of the popular religious sites and, well, the debates that she knows about are little more than veiled racial, racial slurs. But they have one thing in common, the two of them, Nicodemus and this woman at the well. They both need Jesus. You see, because while Nicodemus had Every advantage from birth. Jesus said, you only need one thing, Nicodemus. You need to be born again. You need a new birth. And while she has the bucket and the well, only he could quench her thirst. It's a familiar text. Many of you know it. You've heard it before. And there's a lot in here, but I want to I want to ask you to do something this morning for me. Instead of instead of making like it's the airplane and I'm the stewardess going through the details once again about what happens when on if the plane should go down, I would like to ask you to pay attention. Pay attention once Again, because, you know, sometimes, sometimes the seats aren't bolted. And they slide around. And when that happens, you're wishing you had a refresher. So this morning, I'm going to give you a refresher. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story, let me set the context for you. Uh, there, Jesus has been in Ju- uh, Judah, the southern region of Israel. While he is there, tensions start to mount between him and the religious establishment at the time. He decides that it's best to travel up north to the north country, which is called Galilee. For those of you who are familiar with your geography, you will know that in order to go from uh, is, uh, from Judah to uh, Israel or Galilee, actually, you have to um, you have to travel through Samaria. It's the uh, it's the straightest route, and so that's why the narrator tells us, verse four, that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, there are many a preacher who have capitalized on this because they have said, well, you know, Jesus didn't have to go to Samaria. He could have circumvented Samaria by crossing the Jordan to that area, which is now called Transjordan, going up to the top and moving back across. And there are many, many a preacher who have capitalized on that 
point, including yours truly. There's only one problem. That is that there's this Pharisee, or well, one who calls himself a Pharisee, a Jewish historian, and he said that actually Jews did take that route quite often. They didn't like it, but they took it, and he took it. And as he takes it, verse 6 says that he grew tired, weary from the journey, and he sits next to a well. The great Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached a sermon, one of his finest on that point. The fact that the word made flesh, the fact that the one who was with God and who was God, through whom all things exist and without which nothing came into being, which has come into being, the God, the one true God who never slumbers or sleeps, that he grew tired and is sitting by a well. But I'll leave you to look up that sermon and we'll let Spurgeon preach that. Because he's by the well and it's high noon. That's what the text says. The Jews called it the sixth hour. And as he is there, sitting there, tired, weary, a woman comes up. She's making her normal routine, going for water. It's probably a daily journey for her, and as she walks up to the well, she sees him. And they have an encounter. John 4 is the record of it. You know much of it. You've heard it before, many of you know a lot about this encounter and there are many things which we could which we could pull out but what i want to suggest to you is that what she does here is absolutely predictable given her age given her history given her background given her nationality what she does is absolutely predictable it's expected but what he does, it's astounding. No one could have ever imagined it in retrospect. Nobody could have ever conceived it as a prospect. You see, there were not powers of imagination in this time to make up a story like this. If the early followers of Jesus were concocting a story about their Messiah, well, they would have never written this. What he does is astounding. But what she does is predictable. Save one thing. Verse 28. At the end of it, she leaves her water jar. The very thing that she came to do, get water, she leaves. Perhaps you know what that's like. Um, your wife sends you to the store to get eggs. And you walk into the store and you see, um, as you walk in, you see, oh, that, that cheese sample looks interesting. So you walk back to the corner and you get your cheese sample and you think, that's good. I'm going to pick up some of that. So you pick up the cheese sample. And as you pick up the cheese sample, you think, well, I got to get some crackers to do this. And as you're walking over to get the crackers, you realize, oh, that, that coffee looks nice on display. And you drink some coffee and you're like, yeah, that's good too. And you know what would go really well with coffee is ice cream. So you pick up your crackers, you pick up your ice cream, you pick up your coffee, and then you go get in line at the checkout. As you're walking through, you pay for it all, and then you go home and you give the bag to your wife, and she starts putting things away, and she says, honey, where are the eggs? And uh, I say, I mean, you say, be right back. That was the very thing that she went for. You ever done that? You ever forgot the very thing that you were going for? So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the time. It's 12 noon in the first century in an arid climate. And she's out of water. The very thing that you need to live, it is a necessity. We don't think it all about it a lot, but sometimes it comes up like when Haiti is devastated with an earthquake and their water is filled with sewage. Could you imagine being there and someone sends you off because you hear there's water in a nearby village and so you were going on behalf of, uh, of your, your community and you're going to get water. Could you imagine going there? You're thirsty. You haven't had water in, in a day or two. And, and as you go there, you get there. Could you imagine being distracted and coming back without the water? You know, some people happened to me this week, 
when you get really, really busy with things, you forget about food and you don't eat lunch and you get home at night and you go, I forgot to eat lunch. But you just got so carried away. But you know what you don't forget? Thirst. Why does she leave her water jar? I have a, a very, very low ambitions this morning. This morning, I just want to try to answer that question. Why did she leave her water jar? Well, perhaps it was because she was shocked. I mean, she walks up to the well as she'd done on any day, and, and there's this man sitting there who says in verse 7, Give me a drink. Give me a drink. And, and she is... She's shocked. She's surprised by it. Look, she, she says in verse 9, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, Sam, a woman of Samaria? See, she's so, shocked for two reasons. She's shocked. This is shocking because he was a Jew. And as the narrator tells us, Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans did not enter mix. You see, for a Jew, a Samaritan was an half-breed, someone who had defiled their race and their religion. Uh, in, in fact, that there's, uh, there's even some at this time, uh, it seems that they thought that, that, you know, that if you were to share, well, most of this time thought that if you were to share anything with a, a Samaritan, you would be ritually defiled. So bad, so bad was it, was that even a Samaritan woman, who this is, if her shadow fell on you, you might be ritually defiled. So what are you doing, a Jew, asking me for a drink, a Samaritan woman? What do you have to do with me? But it's not just that he's a Jew, it's also that he is a man. And men didn't talk to women in private in those days, at least not the kind that were virtuous. Not the kind with pure motives. But it's probable that given her history, she's known a lot of men who didn't have pure motives. She's known a lot of men whose motives were false. What are you doing, a man asking me for a drink? A Samaritan woman. If he would ask for a drink for me, what else might he want? It's shocking. Maybe she leaves because of that. Maybe that's why she leaves. But no, we got a lot of text left. She sticks around. Why? Well, maybe it was something about him that put her at ease. Maybe it was the way he spoke. Maybe it was the way that he looked at her in the eyes. Maybe it was uh, something like the fact that later he says in verse 16, go call your husband and tell him to come here. Had she ever had another man that was alone with her who would speak to her so tenderly, so softly, and look in her eyes and tell her, I don't want to be alone with you though, go call your husband? Or perhaps it was just plain old curiosity because of what Jesus says Next, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Perhaps that's why she leaves her water jar. Perhaps it's because she left to find the living water. Because, you know, when she hears the word living water, she's thinking fresh water, water that's running Water that's drinkable, water that's pure. I mean, you've probably been out to seen the pool in the middle of the winter that's not been taken care of. You don't want to drink from that. Maybe you've gone and played out on the golf course and they try to beautify the golf course with the water and then you get close to it and you realize that that's, that isn't so pretty. But fresh running water, running water like that, the water that comes to this this well 200 feet below the ground, that is drinkable. Maybe he's saying, I, I've got a source of drinkable water for you. And she says, all right, I'm going to go off and find that. But that can't be it because look at her response. She says in verse 
11, very skeptically, um, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? What resources do you have to meet my needs? I'm the one with the cards. I got the pail. I have the well. Who are you? Are you greater than our father Jacob? You know, because Jacob, that patriarch, that mutual patriarch that both of us respect, well, he surely didn't find any running water beyond here. He needed a pail because he dug this well. Are you greater than him? She questions him, but he maintains his claim. Verse 13, Jesus says to her, Now everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, speaking of the water in the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Whoever drinks of this water, the water that I give him, will never be thirsty again. How can that possibly be true? How could it be true that that the water that... That you give, I I would never thirst again. And she calls us bluff. Look in verse 15. Give me some of this water. So I will not be thirsty and have to come here to draw water. That sounds pretty good. Come on. Show me where it is. I'll play. But of course, Jesus is talking about a different type of water and a different type of thirst. It's a thirst which we all have. It's a thirst deep down within us. You know it. I know it. We all know it. We don't know it by the name thirst. We call it something else. Discontentment. It's that feeling inside of you that sends you running from one boyfriend or girlfriend to the next. It's that feeling inside of you that sends you running from that career to this career to this career. That thing that drives you from this party to the next party. And it's that nagging suspicion that when you get home from the party, it won't be enough. It keeps you thinking about the next one. That when you land the job, you wonder, is it going to be enough? Will I really be content here? Or when you get into that relationship and you think, are they really going to satisfy me? That's the thirst that Jesus is talking about. It's that thirst that is deep within us all. The thirst that keeps us asking the question, is this going to be enough? And the answer is no. It's not. Because the water that Jesus is talking about is not simply a water which you drink. He's not talking about H2O, and he's not talking about a water that you can get in any of those places either. The thirst, the only thing that will, content, it will bring contentment is what he calls living water. It's a thirst for God. See, because throughout the Old Testament, God is described as the fountain of living waters. We read one of the texts earlier in Jeremiah 2, verse 13. My people have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Jesus says, you're thirsty. You're thirsty for God. That's the only thing that will quench your thirst. That's what you need. And she and us might want to know, well, how do you get this water? Jesus told us, if you knew the gift of God and who I am, you would ask me and I would give it to you. Jesus says, I, I will give you the living water. I will quench your thirst. I will quench, satisfy that deep, deep discontentment. But you see, if that's true, then verse 11 is not just her question, is it? It's our question as well. Remember what she says? She says, "Uh, who, who are you? Uh, who are you to, to, to tell me that, that we, can, we can get this water? You have no pail. You have 
No, bucket the well is deep. Where do you get this living water from? Do you see what she's saying? She's saying, how can you meet my needs? How can you meet my deepest needs? But isn't that all of our question? Is Jesus enough? Can he really meet my deepest needs? Can he really meet these deepest desires? Is Jesus enough when the results come back and the doctor calls and the prospects are grim? Is Jesus enough when he doesn't ask? Is Jesus enough when she walks away? Is Jesus enough in the midst of this difficult family situation? Is Jesus enough? When my prospects at going to law school are vanquished, will he be enough? See, it's not just a question, it is the question. There's a pastor who talks about a time early in his ministry when a young girl comes into his office and she is there, and she is very um, emotionally distraught, bawling her eyes out, and, and she cries. And the reason that she is, is bawling her eyes out, crying to him, and so distraught is because she has not gotten asked to the prom yet. And she says in the midst of this, I know that God loves me. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that I'm secure in him, but what does that matter? When nobody asked me to the prom. Do you, do you hear? Do you hear that girl's question? Will Jesus be enough? You see, we're all, we're all little pimple-faced girls. Deep down. Who are asking the question. When we don't get asked to the prom. Will Jesus be enough? And in this text, Jesus wants you to know, I am enough. Anyone who comes to me, anyone who drinks of the water that I give him, will never thirst again. But some of you have heard this before. You've heard all this about Jesus satisfying your soul. You've heard all this about coming to Jesus and being full and being content and being filled. And you ask the question today, then why do I still thirst? I've already believed in Jesus. I've come to him. Why do I still thirst, Kyle? And I've got two answers for that. One answer comes in the form of of a question. And it's simply this. Are you drinking? Are you really drinking from the fountain of living waters? Or have you developed a contingency plan? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? A contingency plan that says, well, I I better do this. Uh, if Jesus, if that Jesus thing doesn't work out, at least I've got, you know, a house in Santa Barbara. If that Jesus thing doesn't work out, if this turns out to be a hoax, at least I've got a lovely family. At least I've got my career. And so I haven't wasted my life. I haven't spoiled my life. At least I've got these things. At least I've got some joy. Uh, or let me ask it another way or put it another way. It looks like this. I have to to marry her in the case that Jesus isn't enough. I have to have that career in the case that Jesus isn't enough. You see, have you developed a contingency plan? Because if you're like me, then my guess is that you are drinking not out of one stream, but two streams simultaneously. But the problem is, is that one of those streams is full of salt water. And is leaving you thirsty. 
But there's a second response, and that is this. I want you to look at verse 14. I want you to pay close attention to it. He says, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Did you notice it? The water that I will give him give him will become it's future tense you see this promise is not that that the eternal life is going to that the uh that the satisfaction is going to come the the water of life is going to come gushing all at once Uh, no if we were to take the metaphor seriously then it suggests that that it is like a bathtub going to fill up welling up in him that it is, it doesn't come all at once, it, it, it comes over time. I have a water filter, um, it's a good thing to have when you live in places like Santa Barbara. There are a lot of lovely things about Santa Barbara, the water is not one of them. And, uh, and you need a water filter, and so when you pour your water into the water filter, we have this water filter where the top, um, well it doesn't lock, and so you put the water in, some of you might know the one I'm talking about, or you've been around the one I'm talking about, and so what happens is some of the water drips down, and you get a little impatient, and so you pour it, right, and then it all comes out all over your pants or whatever, uh, or the, uh, the, the friend's carpet who invited you over, and you're a bit embarrassed, and they're like, well, yeah, it just takes a little while, be patient, it takes a little while, be patient. Jesus is saying it doesn't all come at once, but just because it isn't complete today doesn't mean that it isn't real today. Just because it isn't full satisfaction, the full satisfaction that Jesus promises to give us one day, someday, doesn't mean it's not real satisfaction in the here and now. You see, this is the difference between the satisfaction that Jesus gives and all those other things that we run to, all those other things are contingent. They're dependent on something else going right. Dependent on the way they treat you. Dependent on the law school. Dependent on this. Dependent on this. This is Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He will be there. And so... We are satisfied in the here and now in many ways. Let me tell you a couple of those ways. I have had a lot of questions in life. You know, there are certain questions I don't ask anymore. There are certain things that I don't seek to know, like who God is and how I can have a relationship with him and how my sins can be forgiven. I don't ask those questions anymore. I am satisfied. There are a lot of questions I have, and there are a lot of things that I want, and there are a lot of aches and desires in my heart, but there are certain things that have been fulfilled, really and truly. But she doesn't get that. She still thinks he's talking about water, a water which means she won't have to come back and draw from the well. So... What is it then that causes her to leave, that causes her to run away, that causes her to leave her water pail? Well, if nothing up to this point in the story has caused her to run away, then what Jesus says next would. At least it would cause me to run away. Jesus says in verse 16, go, call your husband and come here. Well, the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Maybe that's why she runs away. Maybe she runs away because she's exposed. You know, it's an overwhelming thing to be known. It's a scary thing to be known. And by a perfect stranger, she is found out. But what's going on here? I mean, this seems a bit cruel. Uh, on the one hand, it seems like a non sequitur. I mean, Jesus seems like he's switching the subject. We've been talking about living in water, and all of a sudden he's like, call your husband. Uh, what's going on? Well, as we saw in John chapter 3, uh, sometimes there are non sequiturs, apparently. But I would suggest to you that this isn't a non sequitur. I would suggest to you that we take John's word to heart. When he says that the Son of Man came in into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might have life through 
him. What's going on here? I mean, it looks like Jesus is just condemning her. And a lot of Christians have taken this approach, right, when they're talking to unbelievers about the gospel. They say, here's what I need to do. I need to point out your sin so that you will feel guilty. But might I suggest to you that Jesus is not exposing her guilt? He's exposing her need. And there's a huge difference. He's not condemning her. He is convicting her. This is not a non sequitur. We have been talking about your need. And you know what we're still talking about? Your need. And you know why, why you can know that you're needy? Look at your life and consider your thirst. What is it that has had you running into the arms of one man after another? You're thirsty. You're thirsty, Jesus is saying. Cheryl Crow came out with an album in the mid-90s called Tuesday Night Music Club. It is one of the greatest albums of the mid-90s. That's my professional opinion. And in the midst of that album, there's this song called Strong Enough. And the song is about a girl and her need and desire to feel attention, affection, love from a man. And in the midst of that song, the, the chorus of it goes like this. Lie to me, lie to me. I promise I'll believe. Lie to me, lie to me. But please don't leave. Do you hear what she's saying? Tell me you love me. I don't care if you're lying. Just tell me you love me. I'll believe you. Just don't leave me. I don't care if there's another woman. I don't care if you're not really interested in this. Just tell me you love me. Lie to me. Because I'm starved for affection. I crave it. I thirst. When I was in college, I was getting advice from my mentor and pastor who I had grown up under. You, some of you have met him. He preached here during my ordination. And as we were sitting down and talking, he had these kind of words of wisdom to me. He said, this observation, he said, I'm looking at your life and here's what I see. Um, I see someone who is very, very, very restless. And then he went on. He said, um, you went off to college at, at Auburn and got involved in Reform University Fellowship there and that wasn't big enough, and so then you started being involved in Reform University Fellowship across the South at Vanderbilt, at Mississippi College, at Ole Miss, and, and doing ministry there. And then when that wasn't enough, you felt like uh, the South wasn't big enough, and so you went overseas, and you spent time in England. And then after spending time in England, you spent a year in Austria, and you were restless. He said, your dad's restless too, and you have it, and you need to be satisfied with him. Consider your life, Jesus is saying. Consider why you keep moving. Doesn't your continual need to move from one place to the next show that you are thirsty? Consider your perpetual gambling. Doesn't that show that you are thirsty for something? Consider the fact that you run from one relationship to the next. Doesn't that show that you are thirsty? Consider the fact that, that you, you always have to, you are obsessed with perpetual change in your life. You can't keep your hair color the same. You keep getting new tattoos. Think about it. Doesn't that show that you are thirsty Consider your life. Consider the fact that you can't stick with a, a sport or a hobby or a, a college or even a spouse. You're thirsty. Consider your life. What thirst are you trying to quench with that second dessert? What thirst are you trying to quench with that midnight snack? What thirst are you trying to quench what deep, deep, deep desire are you trying to satiate with that infatuation? Consider your life, 
Jesus is saying. She, she is found out. But she doesn't leave. Not at that point. Why? Well, because here's a man who's told her everything she's ever done. And he is a perfect stranger. And she thinks, I found a prophet, verse 19. And then she gets him involved in this religious controversy in verses 20 through 24 about the, between the Jews and the Samaritans. And you know how religious controversies go. Often things, people get offended. Things get heated. Maybe that's why she left. Maybe it's because he offended her. I mean, they start talking. She says, listen, Jews worship on this mountain. Samaritans worship on this mountain, which is true. And he ends up kind of qualified, but still, he sides with the Jews. Maybe he offended her. <laughs> she, she said to him, did you, did you hear? She was like, okay, okay. Well, when the Messiah comes, he'll straighten all this out. Okay. Ever heard that before? Oh, you're, you're a pastor, right? Oh, you've done some studies. Okay. So what does it mean when it says that Peter's the rock? What does it mean? What is that talking about? What is the unforgivable sin? What is that? What does that mean? What does it mean? Oh, tell me about this predestination thing. What is that all about? But you're, you're a scholar. Tell me. Oh, well, well, we'll all know when Jesus comes back, won't we? When Messiah comes, he, he will tell us all things. Maybe that's the thing. The, verse 25, the Messiah will clear everything up. Maybe that's why she leaves. She's offended. But that doesn't really make sense. Because why would she leave her water pot? And if I was offended, I think I would still take my water. It's 12. In the middle of the day. 12 noon. It's hot. She has no water. Why did she leave? And why was she there at 12 noon in the first place? That's not the time when women go to the well. When women go to the well, they would go late in the afternoon when it's cool or early in the morning when it's cool. And they wouldn't go alone. Why is she alone? Where's her husband? Where are her friends? Where's her family? Where, where are these people? Where are they? She went alone because she was alone. She went alone because nobody wanted to be with her except for him. She left her water pot because she was transformed. Because he saved her. You know how I know? She left her water pot. Her priorities change. She is no longer going to get filled with water. She is now gone, and she is concerned that other people would be filled with water. She is no longer scared about being alone and going alone. She can face the people of the city, and now she is no longer obsessed with men. She's obsessed with a man. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? How did he do it? I want you to look at verse 26. She says, I know when Messiah comes, he will explain all things. And then Jesus says in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. That's what one writer calls the transforming moment. Do you know what off-scouring is? You heard that word, off-scouring? Let me explain it to you. Uh, when you're doing the dishes and you've had a bunch of people over and you're scraping the food off the dishes into the sink and it starts to build up, you know that sludge and grind that kind of gets there? It's kind of, that's off-scouring. You know how disgusting that is? And you want to like wash your hands after it? I mean, it's just a disgusting word. Off-scouring. The thing that you scrape off of your plates before you put them into the dishes. You, you know that Jews were considered the off-scouring of the world. They have been in many times and places for a long time. But you know who the offscouring of the Jews were? Samaritans. And this is a Samaritan. It's not just a Samaritan, it's a woman. 
a prayer that was going around about this time, it seems, was, uh, O oh Lord God, and I say this not because it's good, but because it's true. There was a prayer going around about this time that said, O oh Lord God, I praise you that I am not a woman. The rabbi said that to teach a woman was to waste your words. The offscouring of the world was the Jews. The offscouring of the Jews was the Samaritans. The offscouring of the Samaritans was the Samaritan women. And you know who the offscouring of the Samaritan women were? Her. And you know what verse 26 is? One of the greatest self-declarations and clear self-declarations of Jesus' Messiahship in all of his ministry. And you know who he gave it to? He gave it to her. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. That Jesus would come to the likes of her and you and me. You see, it is, it is an incredible thing. It is a fearful thing. It is an overwhelming thing to be known. But it is an exquisite thing, a sublime thing to be known and loved anyway. Come see a man who told me everything I ever knew. Everything that she did, everything that she did was predictable. Given her race, given her status, given that time, everything that she did was predictable. But everything that he did was amazing, astonishing. It could have never, ever, ever have been imagined in retrospect. It could have never been predicted in prospect. You see what I'm saying. Some of us think that there's just so little evidence for Christianity, and what it is is our great faith that overcomes that. If we had John 4, it would be enough. Truly, this is the Son of God. This isn't the story about the woman at the well. It's the story about the man with the water. This isn't the story about the woman of Samaria. Samaria. It is the story of the man from Galilee. You can trust him. He will satisfy your soul. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we do ask that you would satisfy us with yourself. Fill us in such a way that we are weaned off of all the other sources of life that we go to. And may we truly live in you. For Christ's sake, amen.